Um, so I'm Salome. Uh, I graduated from the program in 2014. You can probably get Michael Jackson off the screen. Um, uh, and I'm a visual artist and currently a fellow at Ford Foundation about evaluating their cultural strategies to include a tech lens. And Ford Foundation uh, is a social justice foundation um, with headquarters here in New York. Um, so as a visual artist, there are a couple questions that guide uh, my practice. I'm thinking constantly about uh, how to create spaces for narratives that have been historically marginalized. Um, I'm thinking about how to ensure technologies are not repeating the social inequities we see at IRL. I'm thinking about uh, access to t new tools and how to red redistribute resources for fair use, equitable use. Um, so after Parsons, I grouped up with some friends to start this space called Power Plant. Uh, it's a nonprofit organization that has been around for about four years. We're an artist-led digital collaboratory. So not a digital lab, a collaboratory. Uh, we offer free digital art and tech classes to teenagers and sliding scale workshops for adults. Um, so it was a pop-up school at Red Bull Studios um, in Hunter College before we got our own brick and mortar space in Bushwick. So our classes range from how to build websites, how to design a logo in Illustrator, and um, how to use Ableton. Our most popular classes, um, our most popular class is a woman-led, um, woman and friends only DJ class with a group here called This Woman uh, and Intersessions. We also have monthly residency programs where artists working with digital tools can take over the space to host events and exhibitions. Um, and so here are a list of partners we've worked with. I'm sharing this slide to show the diversity and capacity of our partners. I'm constantly thinking about how to bring unlikely partners together so we can share resources, funding, and ideas. I think this was the thing that I figured out the best during my time at DT, knowing what skills I had that I could share with others and what skills other folks had with me. And I've just been trying to scale that out since I've left. Um, so I want to be transparent about like how funding happens. <laughs> um, so I'm going to back up a little bit and start talking about my, my practice. Uh, so during my thesis, I built this uh, participatory pirate radio station, uh, which got me uh, a commission right out of MFADT to work with Creative, Creative Prime, which is a local public arts nonprofit. They asked me to outfit a 1959 cotton candy paint Cadillac with a web radio server. It's so beautiful. So we had shows that ranged from hyper-local black history lessons to live DJ sets. Um, the Cadillac has traveled to a couple historically black neighborhoods across, across the country. So that's uh, Brooklyn, they're North Houston, and parts of Atlanta. Um, and what I love about this project is that it made public radio truly public. Anyone could kind of come up to the microphone um, and say what they got to say. Um, so this is a project I did about three years ago. When I, uh, while doing a residency at the New Museum. I partnered with a curator, Ali Rosa Salas, and uh, a dancer, Kaido Cozy, to make this game using Connect. Uh, it teaches you how to do the real Harlem shake. So in the summer of 2012, DJ Bauer came out with a song called Harlem Shake, which prompted people to make viral videos like these. And while this might look fun, videos of the real Harlem shake sort of got lost on the internet. You have to go pages and pages into a YouTube search before you could find the original dance form. Uh, so during our residency, we invited light feet dancers who are like the last keepers of this dance. You've probably seen them on the subway train. Um, so we invited them into the museum and, to dance and to track their shoulder movements, and we used this to create uh, data for the game. All right, so when you play the game, you hit this big, red inviting button, which launches in a, a minute-long instructional round uh, with Craig and Cozy, you learn the, fundament the fundamentals of the dance, and then you go into a battle round against one of the dancers, and most people lost the game. Uh, so after that, I started a residency at IB with uh, Ayo Dumala Open Sunday, who also graduated from this project, and he possibly was one of some of your teacher, and he was like a teacher to some of you. Um, so the Yapo Repository is a future resource library that houses a collection of art artifacts made by and for 
people of African descent. Yeah. <laughs> you guys can still hear me, right? Okay, just like a little annoying. Uh, okay, so we asked, I don't want to take, oh, oh, perfect. Okay. So we asked per, uh, participants uh, to become archivists of the Yapo repository and ask them to invent future artifacts through this card game. So you're given a narrative card, a domain card, and an object card, which sort of becomes like this light scaffolding and it provides some parameters for you to think about the future. Um, so then you sketch out your idea on this worksheet. It's a very official worksheet that then gets archived in our repository. Um, and then our archivists are asked to sign their sketch so they know that they're owners of their designs. Um, and we partner with community organizations to host us, universities and museums. Um, We've done residencies, again, at ID and at Laundromat Project Recess. Uh, last year, we tweaked our workshop curriculum a bit uh, through a fellowship with BIA August Wilson Center in Pittsburgh. Uh, we added three tracks that make time for exposure and hands-on exploration with the new technologies. Uh, with new technologies, that way participants have, they can get more involved in the making process. So one workshop track asks participants to rapid prototype using uh, basic or chart components, so like this, the key comp. Um, we have a VR engineering track that asks participants to sketch their artifact ideas in three space using Vive and, and Tilt Brush. And this is most, most of the participants' first time in VR, which is really exciting for me to see someone put on a headset for the first time and really explore. And the third track is digital fabrication, where we show folks how to laser cutters to reprint some element of their artifact idea. So a couple examples. Um, so this is a, uh, a body suit where the archivist was thinking about the trauma that comes with the uh, transatlantic slave trade experience, the post-trauma that comes. And so she wanted to create a, therape a therapeutic body suit that gives you the com common sensation of being underwater. Um, so we, take, we took the sketch back to our studio. We fully realized it, so it's functioning. Um, there are tubes that circle around the body that are pumping water, and there are vibrator motors at each one of the cups that are synced to uh, tidal patterns of the Atlantic Ocean, so you get this nice undulating wave-like vibration on your body. And we also have films uh, with the finished artifacts that sit in our, our moving uh, archive. So this is chemo, a device that is portable and can also be worn as a necklace. It picks up on negative vibrations and quickly alerts the wearer. So we had to figure out with the participant, how do you quantify and qualify negative vibrations? Which led us to a conversation about um, racist policing, uh, state-sanctioned violence. And so there is a GPS module in this necklace that lights up when the wearer is at an intersection where there's been a police-involved shooting in New York. Um, these are affirmation pills, a, a vitamin-like supplement, supplement that when taken um, give you a specialized black history lesson. So this person came in and was thinking about microaggressions, and it's like, wouldn't it be great if you could just give someone a pill and they understand some aspect of your, of your culture? And so here we have rock and roll, civil rights, and transatlantic slave trade. I love this because when we have it in exhibition, I always catch someone taking the pills as if they like they fell so deep into the wall text the uh, thinking about uh you know when you take a shell from the ocean you put it to your ear you can hear an ocean, you can hear the waves she's like wouldn't it be great instead of hearing waves you could hear uh a, a the sounds of our femme ancestors, women ancestors. So we created a radio station inside of a shell. So when it's on display, you can just pick it up and hear a um, uh, curated set by a DJ. And there's a phone that goes with this one. So when we exhibit the project, we include the artifacts along with the manuscripts, the original drawings, and some of the films. And um, we also include this, what we're calling a rare media division. So just context. Um, you put it, it's a dead drop library when you um, take information out, you have all the PDFs, the music, the images, all the things that we were reading during the process of making this. And just some quick reflections. Uh, we've learned a lot. First, we learned that when you work collaboratively, you have to let go. All those artists may have initial visions for what the project 
should be and will be. Uh, when you have other cooks in the kitchen, it gets stirred, right? So we have to we have to let go. This is a sad IO after our first failed attempt of doing an on the street workshop where we thought, yeah, folks are just they're definitely gonna stop and talk to us during their busy holiday shopping about the future. No, that's not gonna work, right? Um, so we have to be aware and considerate of what we're asking people to do with us. We have to consider levels of engagement. And also that what we're doing already it work what we're doing that already exists under uh, an established legacy of creating self-determined societies. Activists and cultural workers have always been designing systems and tools for their communities. Um, and we also learned that most of the ideas coming out of our workshops were about real things happening now. In 2016, we collected a lot of artifacts and missions that were about protecting black people from different aspects of the criminal justice system. Um, from policing to mass incarceration. Last year we collected some artifacts that were trying to mitigate anxieties around political structures, like creating alternatives to voting booths. Um, so our workshops just provide a, a safety and a levity for discussion around the issues and violence uh, affecting us presently. And so we're, we've been talking about rethinking and calling our workshops um, after futures because maybe our workshops are simply design thinking or strategy building workshops and the objects we make together are prototypes for the alternative and the radical. And I'll close there. And then we're gonna have presentations by three DT students. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hello everyone, I'm Sivan. Uh, today my presentation will focus on three main components, uh, digital ground technology, and I'll talk a little bit about computer vision technology and its possibilities, uh, and my thesis outcomes. So I believe, can anyone say that never find themselves in this position? I'm yeah, no. So yeah, we are spending a lot of time with digital interfaces and it's almost becoming a changing how we understand the world, how we understand other people, how we relate our body with our environment. And I believe there's something important to discuss about that. And it's also changing how we interact with each other, how we interact with the world that we're and coming from a uh, architectural background, I'm all, I always care like how we interact in space, how we use our body. Um, and learning that an average American spends 10 hours in a day with consuming media, and we all know that media means requires some level of digital interaction today. How we reach media is based on all these digital interfaces. And this was the moment that I was questioning myself and in general the public how this is changing our how, how we define our human by existing in the world. Um, and I really agree with this quote, we need to ask questions about the altered and altered effects of screens that, that are surrounding us today. And all these thoughts and ideas make me question, why do we need the screen for it at the first hand? What is the main goal, main purpose of the screen? And to me, the simplest answer to this question is building some level of information. The purpose can change. It can be for entertaining. It can be for contacting people with each other. But there's always some kind of information that we build with these things. And if the purpose is this, what is the difference between all of these that we've used during the time for building information and this digital way? Can we assume that, can we claim that this uh, a K drawing on a wall is a screen, or an ancient tablet can be considered as a screen. And to me, the answer is yes. But also, there is a really important difference that we should consider the content, the amount of the content, the nature of the content is completely different because, on the one hand, the content is created, it is limited, and it takes all our attention uh, for a while. And 
there is a purpose behind it. And in the vision of the Lord, it's like an infinite window opening to the infinite world of information. And I believe that's the reason why uh, it is changing our behavior. Uh, we pay a lot of attention, we have to pay a lot of attention to this diverse content that we lose our attention to our environment or in the opposite way, because there is a huge amount of content, after a while we start to lose our attention on the content itself, we don't really dig deeper in it. Uh, and again, to turn to my own experience, but I, I spend a lot of time with my laptop, as we usually do uh, with my mobile phone, and I just want to create a personal, a dispersive product that detects the moments that I'm interacting with digital interfaces and turn it to, to somehow turn this data to myself. And in the beginning, my idea was having something like waking me up that had an impact on my body. Uh, but during my iteration in the thesis, it uh, became a more of an installation um, piece that shows this drastic data to the audience. Um, and I was I, I had to use computer vision technology to detect deep interfaces. So I had to be deeper about what's happening in this field, how computer technology could work, how computer vision technology works, how AI works today. And there are a lot of discussions around AI, as we all know, all the data sets that has been used for training AI. Uh, it's mostly pessimistic stories for the future, but I think for this project I wanted to focus on how can we augment our perception of environment by using artificial intelligence, computer vision technology. This was the main question I was examining. And how might I reveal ethnographic data on myself by using AI? And these are my very early prototypes, uh, both technical and aesthetic prototypes. And this was like one of the, again, early user tests that this was the image taken by a user that was using the third eye, and these are the responses given by the AI by using Google Vision API. So, plus airline, aviation, airplane, vehicle, aerospace engineering, so these are the top 10 responses I was getting from Google, and it's nonsense. It's like most of the time it didn't make a lot of sense to human beings, but it was interesting that this is also based on somehow human input online. Uh, this is another user test, so the user was able to take the image. It was not taken automatically, and had that button. Uh, and they were getting immediately all these feedbacks, and the responses to this prototype was like, they, they felt that they bothered from this experience because the, the feedback was nonsense to them, and they, he felt like they, their body has been used by AI, by this technology, and the result was not helping them at the end. Um, so through the process, I decided to, because AI is strong right now, if we focus, if we use it for a specific test, so I program it in a way that uh, this product takes uh, photo very seconds, and those images to Google Cloud, receives AI responses by using Google Vision API, and if there's a, any kind of digital interface, any kind of digital screen, the photo, it stores that data in the cloud. And this is uh, my, one of the final um, uh, iterations of, for this product. I want to be that rid of that utilitarian ties of the third eye, but more focusing on the future of AI, how we, if it becomes our part of our body, how the it would look like. So I try to make something look more organic. Um, and I'm using a Raspberry Pi Zero camera and a battery to capture that moment. And I took several videos, uh, like a lot of videos during my performance while I was wearing the third eye and it was detecting the moment. I was just living a, usual, like, a normal day, like being in the spaces that I, I had been. Uh, and this is, and in this video, I wanted to show this ironic relationship with me, with my environment, and with the screen. And as I said, it's a different context that I, I took these videos. 
And these are the data that are collected by just by one part of the data, uh, by the tour guide. And at ETM, I decided to not to use any kind of digital interface for my installation, so I had to discover different ways of delivering all this data collected by this tool and by performance. So I kind of discovered, rediscovered the old ways of showing data, analog ways of showing uh, all this content. Uh, so for my performance, I have lenticular, uh, I use lenticular materials to create kind of a idea of the, the effect of moving images and on the other side it's just a tool uh, that shows the boringness of the data that you have to put a uh, physical input to, to really review the data kind of a data visualization in a tangible way um, yeah i believe for the future having a camera attached to your body is not a, like the newest idea but empowering it ai with ai i think has a lot of more, more potentials than my explorations in doing this process. Uh, it can, I think, transform to something functional that we can also discuss about its impacts, like are we going to spy on our own life or other people's life, or I don't know, it can help visually disabled people or any kind of having disability about understanding and using their perception, uh, using their uh, perception. Uh, using their body to understand the world. Uh, yeah, these are all open to discussion and how it's going to impact, like screen does in the future, um, our lives, our daily lives and culture. And I want to thank you, Jesse, Chris, Anthony, and Andrew, especially Jesse, for his wisdom of for sharing his wisdom on making with me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Lamina Greenfield and my thesis project is called Target and Control, uh, Remembering La Boada. Um, so this project uh, sort of is related to the Anthropocene, which if some people here are not familiar with that term, it's a, a theory that the current geological epoch that we're in is one in which humans are the primary force um, of change on the environment and the climate. Um, and this uh, is through different practices such as uh, carbon emissions that lead to climate change, habitat destruction, um, pollution, all these sort of unsustainable practices that we're currently um, carrying out. And so along with this age, uh, we're currently undergoing the sixth mass extinction. Um, and so what that means is that at this point, of course, species have always become extinct as a natural process of life, but right now species are becoming extinct 55 times higher than this is before humans were on the Earth. Um, and this is accelerating rapidly, leading to a gigantic loss of biodiversity. Um, since 1970, 50% of vertebrate wildlife populations have been lost, and three-fourths of freshwater uh, population, just to give you kind of an idea of, of the loss of life that I'm talking about. Um, and with this, there's different levels of culpability. Um, not everyone is responsible at the same level, so there are different, um, 
to the levels of culpability, as I said, uh, from the global to corporate, to national, and individual. Um, but I just want to make that clear. Um, so I started thinking about this when I came across some tweets by an environmental scientist and um, journalist Eric Holthout. Um, so once again, talking about who is responsible and who faces the greatest effects, there are certain people who are sort of more on the front lines of this, uh, these climate problems. Um, some of them are those living in the developing world, indigenous populations, people who are losing their livelihoods and their lands um, as the climate changes, and then also researchers who see this every day in their own work. So. This obviously has physical uh, effects, negative physical effects on health, but also mental health. So this uh, man, Eric Holthaus, started tweeting about his own psychological problems that were caused by his involvement in climate change research. So he says, I'm starting my 11th year working on climate change, including the last four in daily journalism. Today I went to see the Times said about it. Um, and I've also looked into the research of um, a woman named Ashley Consolo Brox, who studies mental health as uh, in indigenous populations as it relates to climate change. And she's argued that climate change necessitates a work of mourning as well, and able to really process what it means and what's happening. So um, I started to think about the loss of species and how we could mourn certain species that are becoming extinct. Um, and it became clear to me that I wanted to talk about an a particular species. Um, I think it's worthwhile to talk about them individually, even though there's a, a massive global problem. And so, researching uh, during the, the preliminary research for this, I was I was questioning well, which one do you choose? There's so many. Um, there's the Bayou Dolphin. There's um, how about the you know, countless ones. So I decided to focus on a particular case study from the 1920s. Um, involving the coconut moth, um, the scientific name is Lomana iridescens, and it's because this one is unique in that it was well documented, it's the most well documented case of extinction, um, because it was carried out in uh, British colonial Fiji, um, and the reason that this, sorry, there was a campaign of biological control carried out against this moth because it was interfering with colonial uh, coconut um, agricultural practices. Um, and so it was basically like intentionally eradicated. And this is the sort of unique case because of that. Um, and so these are the uh, British entomologists that were called in to study this moth and to figure out the best way to kill it. Um, and so I, through this research, I acquired the primary text that these scientists had compiled. Um, uh, telling about the campaign and the study of the moth. And I was really captivated by the scientific illustrations in this book because I found them to be they're very intricate, intimate, and beautiful, but also sort of perverse because they are a study in uh, death, ultimately. Um, so I thought of studying something so closely and knowing it so well, primarily to figure out how to kill it. Um, and with that, I started to think of the actions of these scientists and the gestures that they made, the, the study as a gesture of destruction. Um, and I, so I kind of wanted to meditate on that and also on my own sort of place in these uh, structures of power, level of practices that are still reverberating today and ongoing today. Um, and then my own complicity in them as an American citizen and an American citizen of European um, heritage. So I have made a video, which is uh, up on the 12th floor, if you want to take a look. And in this, I put myself in the role of these entomologists and explore different gestures, trying to balance um, elements of violence and sort of a covetousness, um, uh, a scientific precision with combined with a sort of childlike recklessness. Um, and so I have a quote thinking about gesture. Gesture is the name of this intersection between life and art, act and power, general and particular, text and execution. It is a moment of life subtracted from the context of individual biography, as well as a moment of art subtracted from the neutrality of the part. It is pure practice. So I think that for me, gesture was a good way to talk about this because 
it does have some sort of um, it is some sort of mediation between the individual and the, the larger picture. Um, and so with processing the loss of species, there's a lot of talk right now related to the technology program. Um, biotech is always being developed and there's certain proposals and studies going on to resurrect or bring back to life extinct species. And I would say that that is impossible. Because there's just not enough DNA depending on when the thing, when the creature went extinct. Um, it's also interesting that the species that are chosen, it's usually because humans had some sort of involvement in their extinction, so there seems to be a sort of wish to absolve one's self of guilt. But you can't bring back a species because it's emergent and contingent. It's it's uh, it's deeply enmeshed in the ecosystem in which it lives and the historical circumstances that led to its um, to its uh, I don't know its its uh, emergence in the world. Um, so even if you were to bring back something like the woolly mammoth, where would it live? What would its community be? How would it have immunity to new viruses today? Um, where would be the other mammoths that would teach it how to to take care of itself. So there are lots of problems that are not being addressed. Um, and then just thinking more about who is responsible and who suffers the greatest uh, consequences, I just wanted to kind of point out, so my, my study was on this law in Fiji, and right now Fiji is one of the countries with the lowest uh, carbon emissions, but it is one of the ones that is most vulnerable to climate change. Uh, and like, so a recent study on climate Fiji would have to spend 4.5 billion, which is equivalent to one year of its gross domestic product in the next 10 years to offset the effects of rising sea levels and tropical storms. Um, so when I'm talking about these things, and I'm still trying to sort of psychologically process them and find my own place and voice um, within it, I am often asked, so well, is my only point that life is that, that things are bad? And you know, my point is that we we can do things to change this, and I think that any small change um, helps. And so, speaking of a moth um, and its extinction, I I was of course also just researching all things moth, and I found this essay by Virginia Woolf called "Death of a Moth," and she talks about the moth as a symbol for life at large. And so she says, watching him, it seems as if a fire as if by the very thin but pure of the enormous energy of the world had been thrust into his frail and diminutive body. When there was nobody to care or to know this gigantic effort on the part of an insignificant little moth against the power of such magnitude to retain what no one else valued or desired to keep in his own strangely. And so my ultimate message is one of hope, and I would like to expand my practice into more of an activism or social or socially engaged arts, but for now it's just sort of my own meditation on it. And that's it, thank you.
everyone that is online living, the people here in the next room. And I'm here to present my current thesis project, which is called Human Venicity 6.5, a possessed vernacular for climate control. So I'll just elaborate on the thesis statement because I'll take some time to explain and kind of dissect the mechanism that I went through. Um, but essentially, Human Venicity 6.5 is a audiovisual proposal for an auxiliary strategy of climate control environment, and it's using as a test site a time, a Thai palm plantation and no. And basically the, the piece features a collection of three 3D rendered shrines that are assigned to maneuver the climate in a specific stage of the palm oil extraction. And in order for the shrines to function, they also operate as a mouthpiece. Uh, for the spirits, so they use Thai spirits as labor to possess the shrines so they can sing through it, and that's how they control the climate. But I'll, um, it's, it's basically taken from, uh, it's a reversal of this linguistic theory that's part of my research, which I will elaborate in a, in a little bit. So, um, Essentially, my research method revolved around three main points of contention that are actual. And also, the first one, which is um, the investigating on positing, positing humidity um, aesthetically and visually in social sciences. Um, so, there's been a long standing cultural and scientific bias against humidity and especially in architectural practices. Um, and human environments are very particular and very interesting because they are such a rich ecosystem, but also very hard to process. Their properties are really hard to process into empirical data and that has led for a lot of architects into methodical shortcomings. They're also known as convertible systems, which are which is basically um, a mixture of two substances in which one of them is uniformly dispersed into the other one. So let's say we can think about maybe kind of solid state dispersed into a liquid state, so you get that viscous um, material texture. And um, there's a really interesting uh, reading by Paul Carter, who kind of talks about the properties of humidity, and he says that it's easy to narrate the life of a river, for a river showed the desires of storytellers to get somewhere, but swamps flow nowhere, nor on the other hand do they provide us a solid foundation if you had a full setting for decisive events, they're resistant and logic. And what he basically implies is that there's been such a majority of lexicon in human environments who've been associated with kind of la laziness and they just figure it's a blot on just the general map of things. So, um, but in, in the last decade, there was a certain change of trajectory, especially in the speculative linguistics realm. Um, a lot of researchers started getting interested in the correlation between climate and especially assigning humidity as a key factor in the development of tonal languages. So in, um, in short, the more hot and humid the climate is, the more complex the tonal systems are used in language. And that mostly happens in West Africa, East and Southeast Asia, and then some indigenous parts of Mexico. And um, one of the properties of human environments is that they supposedly keep the human voice box, which is a larynx, uh, moist, and that um, enables it to develop those complex systems. Um, and I started investigating the Thai tonal language phonetic inventory. And Thai language uh, essentially has five tones, three level tones, which are fixed tones and then two contour tones which are more dynamic. So one word 
may sound the same, but depending on what Ushibana you use, they uh, might see the story differently. And my second point of contention was studying spirit housing and spirit possession in Thailand. Over the holidays, I went to visit a spirit house factory in Bangkok, and it's um, a family-run business that focuses on building little shrines that uh, people will build and are, are attached to the very satellite infrastructure to their land, like a house or a commercial building. And it's, um, metaphorically speaking, that's what communication between humans and spirits. So it's an imaginary space that's also very tangible. And it's kind of like trying to embody immaterial and, and discarnate beings through decision making and architecture. But over the recent years, there's been a change in the architectural styles. It's been kind of like Rico Roman. Uh, Regal Roman architectural styles incorporated as a sign of modernity and then more kind of minimalistic style too as a means to, it's a sign that um, people are interested in developing trend forecasting and adapt folklore practices within the globalized marketplace. So that was the main point of contention. And I decided to kind of call that practice uh, design by proxy. And also spirit possession, which is another type of embodiment of spirits, uh, but that's uh, essentially using the human body as a mouthpiece. Um, so when someone enters this state of spirit, um, when someone becomes possessed, they enter kind of a state of trance and start speaking, but they're essentially speaking on behalf of the spirit. So I was really interested in those practices of, of magic. Um, and I decided to choose the two first point of contentions and actually reverse that linguistic theory and use possessed speech as a potential tool for climate control. And for my test site, um, I wanted to use a Thai operated palm oil factory. Thailand is the third largest manufacturer of palm oil behind um, Indonesia and Malaysia by a large margin, but still producing a lot and it's been subject of many controversies, um, deforestation, and bad, um, bad design in terms of farming, not knowing how to plant the seeds, and there's also been in conjunction a vast campaigns by a lot of multinational companies trying to um, showcase the benefits of sustainable palm oil. So that was the final point of contention. I forgot to say this is a piece of design fiction. Um, so it's not actually rooted in um, maybe the way we think about reality, but more following different references of um, the news and then trying to design my own reality through it and my own mythology. Um, and time all requires a lot of different processes and different temperatures in, from the way the fruit bunches are picked to how the oil is fractioned. And for the shrines, I wanted to use HVAC systems are the main architectural staples because they are simultaneously a staple in industrial spaces. They control the climate, but they're also, aesthetically speaking, a referential conduit to the human wiring. So that was my way of visualizing the spirit the, the sonic manifestation of spirits. And in sourcing the audio content, I mostly sourced everything out of YouTube and mostly got to talk Thai shows. So that's how they would be good material to deploy the tonality of uh, things. Um, so I'll show you a video that's a comparative um, to a comparative framework of two implementation, a shrine that controls a humid zone and that shrine is attached to the palm plantation that's trying to cultivate palm fruit because palm also heavily relies on humidity. And the second instantiation is a dry fractionation of oil. is when oil is being cooled in a chamber to split into different constituents, and it's a dry climate. So that's the video.
that's the second institution, which is using DDP dedicated measures to control life habits. how much time we have left I, I do want to say like I want to get coffee with like all of you at some point and talk about this more um, you brought it some, you all all of your projects are super super interesting and are extremely detailed um, so gonna, we're not going to do it justice but I invite if anyone has questions please jump in I'm going to start with uh, a question around uh, speculation and fiction and I just kind of want to read a quote by Octavia Butler to start. Um, so the boundaries between past, present, and future in all of your projects are, are very blurry. Um, so Octavia Butler once asked, what good, what, it, what good is science fiction's thinking about the present, the future, and the past? What good is its tendency to warn or to consider alternative ways of thinking and doing? What good is its examination of the possible effects of science and technology or social organization and political direction? And she continued, she continued, at its best, science fiction stimulates imagination and creativity. It gets a uh, reader and writer off the beaten track, off the narrow, narrow footpath of what everyone is saying and doing and thinking, whoever everyone happens to be. Um, so the futures you created, uh, or the speculative alternative, are, are alternatives to what footpath? So is there a trajectory you're operating against in your projects? Um, yeah, I think the, the trajectory that I am operating against is the one of sort of continued endless centric thinking and also another challenge that I get a lot with my project has been, well, why should we care about um, animals or other life forms when humans have, like, there are large amounts of humans that are suffering um, now. And I would say that it's all infinitely linked. Um, most of the the sort of abuses and violences that are carried out uh, carried out against humans uh, depend on propaganda that is dehumanizing and usually animalizing. So if we don't have the animalizing um, option, then actually it would also be a way to protect just sort of the life forms in general. And I see a continuation of the practices that I explored in my case study, these sort of reckless um, environmental manipulation and trying to control in a way that we really don't have the power to do and not understanding fully the consequences of those decisions. So I want to encourage people to be more wary, I guess, uh, especially because the technology that we have is developing a lot and there's a lot of proposal to bring back species, wipe out species, and I feel like we're just really um, not going to learn the lesson that we can protect the life that is here now, um, instead of trying to over engineer it so, um, so excessively. Um, I'm thinking about that question, but I'm not sure how to respond to that. As condensed as possible. I feel like to me, the way I posit the, this thesis project is not even necessarily to imagine a future per se, but more comment on how to pick different 
um, points of entry and, and tensions and also different system knowledge of different scales coming from different places that at first seem very different, but I think once you are able to really get to the reality of the connected, the more the more that you can make them interconnected, um, I feel like I was struggling at first uh, during the first semester because I felt like I didn't have the, the content that gave me that view like a moment. I was, I was really very interested by spirit houses, but I didn't, I didn't have that, that thing to frame it which was the um, speculative linguistics theory that came a little bit later. And then I made the connection with, yes, what if we, what if speech could control climate, that's in, and then what if spirits could be used as, a, as some type of labor to control it. So it's different layers of maybe kind of understanding of reality, but also even when magic practices are seen as completely irrational, their their performances are just as real as other as other types of things. Uh, yeah, I was really honest about the uh, actually I I had a really like this mindset as a designer. I was not able to understand what are the possibilities so speculative design or designing fictions. Uh, I think the time that I came here, I struggled a lot with this concept because having that mindset before, it doesn't help to adopt that process of kind of a different, different kind of imaging so you don't have to think functionally, you don't have to make things for, for, for good, like, I don't know, like for function, functional things, but you have to make things that make you question, make other people question, and that's the trajectory that I see, I have. And I think this thesis process helped me to understand this process or discover my own uh, questions on the world and the technologies that we're using. I think that that different kind of mindset helped me a lot to uh, get through this process. That's really interesting. I mean, my questions moving forward are like, uh, I was going to pivot and talk about, uh, I have questions about translation and loss, uh, but this is like, <laughs> I want to like continue on this. Like, did you two also feel sort of the same, um, did you have the same challenges in trying to make something that isn't a, a product? Like your products are mostly dealing with narrative, right? Like they're not, uh, useful, right, it, in terms of like in a capitalist exchange model, right, but like they're useful culturally, right? So did you struggle in this making process? Do you have, yeah, can you speak a little bit about that? Um, yes, I think that um, probably everyone who makes something more artistic has to have that like conversation with themselves like about what they're doing and if it is useful and like why they keep doing it I guess um, but I, I do think that especially in my own topic and research related to climate change um, sort of what what is being discovered now is that the biggest work to be done is the psychological and emotional processing of it. Because the more we sort of throw out statistics, it's just kind of easy to ignore them. Um, and a lot of people have like repressed feelings about it, um, or feelings of helplessness or despair. And I think that that is where art can be super useful to bring those narratives to the forefront. Um, and the, the woman that I mentioned, Ashley Sotomayor, who works with um, in Canada with indigenous populations researching mental health, she was working with this woman who was an activist um, who had lost most of her land and and was speaking in very practical terms. But at one point, Ashley asked her, you know, how do you feel? And she just burst into tears because no one had asked her that before. Like they had been very focused on. Um, the sort of practical well, well, actions and part, part and not, not the emotional, emotional part. part. 
Yeah, there, there were you know, the struggles. There's just so many different phases of, of the struggles. I feel like it's also very easy at the beginning to have this vision about how you're going to execute the project and really bypass actually the whole methodology of it. And you're so impatient of just getting it done. But um, I think the, the hard part is maybe when you maybe when your class has mostly kind of user centered designers um, in terms of feedback it has been I think problematic at times just because that was you know not being able to get maybe the right kind of feedback or, or people didn't really know what to say. And um to, yeah, and it's been a, basically a lot of questions that you ask yourself too, and especially when something doesn't really follow the linear narratives that people kind of are used to, and I used to present their work in, and finding also a different, a specific method of how to even convey as convincingly your points outside the narrative that has been a pretty challenging process too. Because you're constantly oscillating between feeling really good about it and feeling <laughs> as something really new, then also maybe the day after you'll be like, what was I thinking? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of your projects have some relationship to loss. Um, there's a like loss of attention to time, loss of actual living species, uh, loss of folklore and language. And I'm wondering if you can, if one, if this is the right like frame to, you know, the right context to put your work in. Um, and two, did those questions of, of loss or grieving or mourning come up um, in your research or practice? Um, yeah, that was sort of the, the gateway into my research on this. Um, finding those tweets of Eric Holthouse. Um, and then also reading the writings of um, Naomi Klein, where she talks about she, when she was younger, she always saw starfish growing up in British Columbia. And um, she wanted to bring her young son to see them, but they had been afflicted by sea star leaking syndrome. Um, and so she, realized, she started to um, just imagine the future where this really important part of her childhood was inaccessible to her own child. And so those like emotional um, appeals were kind of what made me sort of wake up to these issues. Um, and then I started to do some research in mourning in general as uh, mourning is usually thought of as an individual practice, and it definitely is, but it can also be a political um, tool. So I started looking at the theory of Judith Butler, who looks at um, which lives are grievable and how like grieving for something is a way to sort of acknowledge it and pay it respect. And so by making the choice to grieve something or not, it's actually, it can be, and especially with the collective mourning, collective recognition of loss, that can be like a, a very political um, phenomenon. Um, to me, um, that's interesting, so I that you said that you used to the word, the, the word about a lot of folklore. Um, the way I was seeing it was that it was more about the loss of kind of nostalgia of maybe growing up with something and how it changes or how it's being implemented and in, in how a folklore practice can be implemented in the globalized marketplace and how it loses its kind of local architecture and then sort of adapts to other knowledge systems and, and gets involved in trend forecasting. Um, I guess it, it, it is kind of, kind of a loss in, in some ways, but it's still, it's, there's a constant cycle of how to maybe aestheticize or update the functions of a landmark or, or a tactic. 
a big tree that was, uh, yeah, I feel like any work of art it has so many different layers of it, interpretation to, um, but yeah, sort of like loss, loss of your points of references as a child, looking at like traditional spirit houses and now having spirit houses made out of the HVAC system screaming to control the HVAC tree. I have been always interested in preservation of culture, and even when I was practicing architecture, I, I found myself questioning about like new constructions, new environments that we are creating, and at the same time, how we can protect, like discussing how we can protect the old city, old buildings. So these were like all everything that I was thinking, and that fear of losing you, losing something. I think it's constant and for human beings. But some of us may be more sensitive to that kind of world. And I also had a lot of fear that I'm be being too conservative, uh, being also nostalgic at the same time. So these are like really challenging. Uh, if you consider yourself as a designer, as an artist, someone that kind of had to make something, but at the same time want to protect the old version or previous version. So that's a dilemma, I think, for me personally. Um, I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> yeah. How are we doing on time? We wrap it up, but if there's any questions from the Okay, we can take audience questions. This is the last panel of the day, right? Oh, uh, there's one more. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think Salome asked the best questions. They were intimidating because we didn't know.